on the air or internet, as the case may be. Ogre and Jason, hello. Hello, Corey. And uh, Afra is either with us or joining us momentarily. Uh, welcome everyone to the first Litany webcast interview, and thank you, Ogre and Jason, for making this happen and choosing Litany to debut the video. Uh, before we start, I just want to send some thanks out there. Thank you to Afra Ahmad, Litany's tech wizard, who made this all possible uh, many times over. So thank you, Afra. And uh, thanks to our illustrious forum mods, that would be Bryden Mish Cheney and Kevin Akagad for their help in setting this up. And thank you to Stacy and Aaron and Angela and Quinn who all helped me test this out and get this going. So thank you very much, guys. Um, let's get right to the questions because we want to make the most of our time. And uh, I want to go to a question from Malleable who asked Jason, how on earth did you end up getting this gig to direct this game? Is that, the, is that the guy that asked the question, how many virgins? Yeah, how many virgins do you have to sacrifice in the job? volcano? Was I think it was his phrasing. Well, you know, Jason, if you ever answer that question, I'm, I'm never talking to you again. You know that, right? You know? <laughs> no, I know. We made a pack. We made a pack. I'm well, not that's, 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 that's like one of those Thailand sex trip packs. <laughs> what happens there stays there. Um, <clears throat> You've got your tattoo, your like, pentagram. Uh, you know, tattooed on your ankle now. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> well, the uh, the cover story that I came up with to protect the real story was uh, <clears throat> basically um, a long story, short story. A friend of mine uh, was working on a film with Ogre, uh, 2001 Maniacs, and I gave her my CD and said, you know, obviously a huge fan, give him my CD, and uh, she did, and he listened to it, and uh, basically was like, he liked it, and was like, wow, you should come open for us. And so I opened for him with, the, uh, with my band, The Alacrity, at the uh, first show of the Insolvency Tour uh, at the uh, Glass House in Pomona. Anyhow, had a great time. Ended up developing a friendship with Ogre and uh, Ashley, his girlfriend, uh, over the course of a couple years. And then I did a short called Astrid, and that short starred Ashley, and she did a fantastic job. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I uh, thought the short turned out pretty well, um, and uh, Ogre did his as well, he thought it turned out pretty, pretty cool, and uh, was very complimentary about it, and then made the mistake one day of saying, wow, you know, congratulations, it looks really great, you know, congratulations, uh, what's next? And I said, uh, I want to do the next Skinny Puppy video. And it was right after, or right before Weapon was going to drop, so positioned myself knowing that, okay, it's going to drop, i got to get in there, like, boom, you guys deserve a video, a really awesome video, you're one of the best fucking bands that's ever existed, you haven't had a video in a while, let me do it. I'll kick ass, and uh, and yeah, and uh, showed him some artwork that I brought, some concepts to kind of show the. Um, and I'm going really long to make this fast, but basically to show kind of like the 8-bit quality and so on. We talked about some ideas, and uh, yeah, he seemed down, and then we just kind of went from there, and and then uh, months later, yeah, well, you purchase is well, it's done. So. There. Yeah, Jason. Good. Jason, um, you know, and I have have known each other for a while. He's uh, an extremely talented multifaceted artist in a lot of ways. I mean, he does a, a lot more than just, uh, you know, you know, video stuff. He's, uh, you know, amazing graphic artist. He's kind of a, a renaissance man, someone I wish I could be if I had a, a better attention span. So, I mean, you know, his, his work is really quality. If you look at any of his stuff, it's, it's, it's uh, top-notch. He really cares. And, uh, you know, he came to us with the concept, and, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a good idea. I mean, I, I tweaked one thing at the end, maybe, and everything else was his, his idea, so... Uh, he cornered me. Well, a little bit more, but not that. There's, not yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot more in there of you than, than you're giving yourself credit for, but. Well, it's, it's, it's it is mostly you, but I mean, he he liked it. the one thing that the truth is that he did corner me at the skinny puffy <laughs> photo shoot. <laughs> I asked him to do a video, and uh, you know, knowing his his talent and stuff, I mean, I uh, you know obviously couldn't refuse, and I think you guys can see how much love was put into it, and. Uh, and, and care and, and you know it, it, it comes from a place of someone that's definitely listened to us for a long time and uh, you know I total trust in the guy to do a good job for sure. So I think you already answered the question from Grave Wisdom, are you a fan? But how do you approach making a video for a band that has this kind of visual history? Were you trying to compete with the past? Uh, no, actually, um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think how to answer this in a in, in the, in the right way. Like, they have a lot of really great videos uh, throughout their past. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
but I always felt like there was, um, like I had never seen the video that I felt that really captured the music in a visual way, in the way that I saw it. So this was kind of a weird thing where, um, literally, I, since I was 17 years old, I was like, I want to make a goddamn skinny puppy video. I'm going to make it look in such and such a way. And then uh, one day I found myself kind of with the blessing and the curse of like, okay, smart guy, you thought you could make a really awesome skinny puppy video. Well, now you, now you have to. So I was like, holy shit. Um, what really made it kind of easy was that the first time I heard Skinny Puppy um, was uh, I lived in the middle of nowhere in Iowa, um, and uh, like the middle of nowhere. And uh, it was getting first time I got stoned was uh, was with this girl, and she had remission on a cassette tape, and uh, I'd never heard anything like it in my entire life. She put it on and blew my fucking mind. So what made it easy, or at least when I was going back to it, was because when Weapon was released, they were going back to that old timey style that. Full time is not the right way, but the word rather. But they're going back to that classic sound, that mission sound, and even you know just working with that material with those instruments. So it was a, almost a perfect fit. So when I approached it visually, as far as developing the visual language for it, um, I really look back to like Stephen Gilmore's like uh, Remission album cover. Like I think the album cover is so iconic, um, and I'm not the only one. I mean, they even carry it, you know, South Park uh, constantly. It's such an iconic piece of art. Like just that low, that low tech. Skeleton with those kind of really cool uh, graphic overlay on it. That's really kind of like I don't know, it looks like newsprint almost. Like I'm not doing a good job explaining it, but that was where a lot of the inspiration for the actual video came from. Um, and then uh, and then keeping it dirty as well. Like one of the Hoger's uh, main notes was like, like, let's keep it dirty. Let's keep it keep it filthy. Keep it textured. Um, so that those things kind of all came together, and and that's what uh, and that's what. Yeah, you kind of. You like sort sorry to interrupt, but you like kind yeah. of did uh, what what H Gun used to do. I, I think it, it it reminds me of that kind of stuff. You know, the stuff that H Gun was doing for Ministry and mm. the Cox a little bit, remnants of that. I mean, you know, again, it's just different choices you make. And you know, he went back through the history of things that you know we've certainly you know kind of put forward in the past and uh, and and did something novel. And uh, I think anyway, I think it's 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 a uh, it's a unique video in, in itself, how it turned out and how it came about. Kind of, um, it preempted again. I, I know I posted this on Litany, but I'm I'm quite proud to say that the concept preempted uh, Edward Snowden's disclosure um, uh, about everything. So the 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 fact that we did tie uh, a lot of communications into this um, was 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 kind of a coup for me. But again, you know, one of those kind of Things that you stumble into, and you know, it, it, it's just it's fun. It's fun when things like that work out for me conceptually. And uh, Jason was 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 gracious enough to go along, you know, with that, you know. So, um, yeah. someone on the forum pointed out in their question the visual connections to Smothered Hope with the skull cracking. Was that all intentional? Uh, no, that was accidental. Um, <laughs> that kind of came from the uh, just from the ride cop. Uh, aesthetic that was kind of going on. Once I kind of figured out what the basic conflict was going to be, um, with like the uh, the suspect and then the riot cop and kind of how that iconography was going to play out, then it just kind of seemed fun, I guess. Um, almost with a little bit of a sense of humor. You know, I wanted something that's badass visually, but also there's a little bit of a sense of humor to it as well, because, uh, you know, Ogre obviously has a really good sense of humor, and Kevin as well. There's always a little bit of sense of humor kind of in Skinny Puppy, which um, maybe a lot of people don't see, but it, it's there. Here and there, but um, like the, the skull cracking, uh, maybe you know, an on the nose metaphor. But um, well, we uh, used to have a, a saying: "Roasted, roasted skulls." <laughs> back in the day, and also, <laughs> also, obviously, the the like, uh, you know, the analogy of the skulls with remission is is true. If I was the riot cop, I guess, because the unfortunate thing about in, in remission was that I used those skulls uh, on my own head. It was the idea of. Uh, Two minds meeting the dead and the and the living, and uh, when I did it live, I actually uh, used one of the wrong skulls. We had three thicknesses throughout that tour, and we always kept them <laughs> in separate boxes. But they always would get mixed up, and I'm sure it was some roadie playing a trick on me. So I happened to use one of the thick skulls that night on the uh, Smothered Hope video. So the, you know, I have all these great images of me. Uh, there's one on me on back and forth six being electrocuted. Uh, looks like Ronald McDonald hair. There's another one of me smashing that skull into my head. That's about two, you know, two inches thick, and then trying to hold back the pain. Uh, being hung, uh, just a lot of great uh, tricks gone wrong, so to say. Mm. So, you know, in a way, I, I, I think it plays homage to that, but I don't think it was ever in, intended. You know, you know. 
of the things you've put yourself through for our entertainment. <laughs> yeah, mistakes. All the things I've stumbled into. <laughs> um, Dash had a question. Uh, why illicit? Ah, uh, well, it was. I I actually left it up to um. I left it up to Jason to choose uh, which track he felt uh, was was the most. And I basically did this. I I left my computer open because nobody had heard the album. <laughs> So I left the computer open so he could, if he wanted to, if he chose to. I didn't. I, I don't know if he ever did either. So I, I don't know. But I left my computer open with the uh, um, iTunes page with the whole album there before it was released, before anybody had heard it. I played him Illicit um, and said this. This is kind of the lead-off track. And I played him, I think, one other one like Sudanama. And uh, I, then I, I I left the room for about five, five, six minutes, seven minutes. So I wasn't sure if he went through everything else. And listen to them or not, and if he did, good, because that was the intention. <laughs> if he did, and uh, and and then he chose illicit uh, as as I think Jason is not right. I mean, I, I think yeah, he ended up. yeah. When you left the room, I did consume a couple more tracks. I kind of, <laughs> kind of gobbled down as many as I, as as I could in the time that you were gone. Um, yeah, uh, I'll I'll make it quick because I don't I don't feel like I'm hogging the interview, but uh, yeah, the uh, he left it up to me, and I had a real hard couple of days to figure it out because they're both really great tracks, and uh, Sudanama being like, I don't know, being very kind of like, in my opinion, at least had like really kind of a too dark parky kind of feel to it, which was just perfect for kind of where I wanted to go visually. Uh, this was before I had everything kind of worked out for, or at least not everything, but you know, I had a direction kind of in mind for for illicit. Um, with the specific of the right cops and skulls and all that kind of stuff, but like you know, my head was just spinning. It's like you know, what can this look like? Oh my God, there's so many possibilities because the way that song just kind of evolves and the kind of monster it turns into is really, really remarkable. And there's so many fun things you can do with it. But I ended up settling on illicit because it had, um, I don't know I just thought it was more of a single. Like it was, um, like it was just more of the, it was more of a single. I thought so. That's why I kind of went with that one and had had the the, um, the catcher hook and yeah, that's kind of why. Why I uh, felt that was going to be the one to really, to really that would work the best for this at least. So with the themes to the album and the video, uh, we have a question from DigiV for Ogre, and that is, would you ever own a gun if you felt threatened? Are you there? Oh, okay. did we lose Ogre? He, he, we lost him. He's back. Yeah. yeah, I'm back now. I got I got blued off. It's a mountain oh, man connection. Sorry. Yeah, you're up in the booth. Were you asking me a question? Yeah. Uh, the question is from DigiV, and it's talking about the themes of the album with weaponry and gun culture. Would you ever personally own a gun? And what are your feelings on that? Um, no. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't own a gun. Um, have I ever been threatened? Uh, yes. I was uh, attacked by skinheads in Canada for wearing uh, a pair of pants that I bought in London that had a red star on them. And they uh, said uh, that I was a communist, and I mentioned uh, very um, kind of half-heartedly and kind of in a funny way that uh, don't you realize you're living in a socialized country? And they beat the shit out of me. So I mean, I've had that happen to me. Would a gun have helped? Uh, no. Um, have I has have, have have I been threatened since then? Yes. I've gone through a very serious period of uh, of uh, of fear. Uh, had I had a gun, I would be in jail right now. Um, pure and simple. Um, if my family was threatened, uh, that's something I guess that I, uh, you know, I always ponder and I always wonder um, about. It hasn't happened to me in, in my 50 years of living. Um, I've certainly put myself in some very dangerous situations throughout my whole life. Um, and again, I, I'd have to answer, unfortunately, and maybe it's my Canadian coming out of me, <laughs> but um, in all of those situations, had I had a gun, I'd be in jail right now. So. Um, and I'm still alive, and I, you know, I haven't been shot, et cetera, et cetera. Um, my feelings about about gun control, about guns, are are um, are a bit, uh, you know, less strong in the sense of who owns a gun. I think, you know, I guess you should be allowed to own a gun if you want to own a gun. My fear is that we get to a time where um, the manipulations are at such, which down in in this country, where you have people believing that, you know certain aspects of the commons within a government is socialism and yellow socialism at that or this negative form of socialism and how they've gotten people to believe um, the exact opposite of what is actually more beneficial to them makes me ponder the idea of guns and the prevalence of guns down here for this reason and only that in the future the biggest conflicts in this country is going to be brother on brother 
and guns is a very decisive issue that separates people. And um, the more we go down this rabbit hole of waking up, um, there's going to be decisiveness and polarization. And my fear is that those guns will be readily available to be used against, uh, you know, uh, brother on brother, which will incur the wrath of a police state coming down uh, on those people. And and we'll just it, it, it's just a perfectly dovetailed um, interlocking pieces of of, of carpentry to me in, in, in a puzzle that I see um, kind of unfolding and I have seen for the last you know 20 years or so so that's my feelings about guns thank you okay let's move on I've got a question here from caustic and he wanted to know how your role in the videos has changed over the years uh, in the music videos yeah music videos well, obviously, I mean, I, I wasn't involved in, in, in this music video. Um, I, I, think, I think Jason did a wonderful job in kind of crafting things with, uh, with more ambiguous looks. And, and, you know, sometimes I think, you know, me being in this type of a video, which is about a skinny puppy concept or, you know, there's an analogy being played out in a way, uh, it, it would take away. I, I, I guess I could have been that character easily. And, and you know, I think... I think even at one time Jason, I think, wanted me to be that character, and uh, um, you know, I, I, I just chose thought that it would be better if it was somebody more ambiguous in the sense of like um, any any man kind of. Um, I guess I could be that any man, but in, in a way, like you know, I, I stink like a sore thumb in in this society as far as things that I've come out and talked about, and I've been open about uh, both within myself and and about my. Um, my own politic and things like that. So, you know, I, I would be the first target uh, from these these sorts of programs that are, you know, capture and kill if they were made uh, more more prominent over here or if there ever was, a, you know, a, a, a disease where the intelligentsia had to be wiped out. And not that I'm making myself even that important because really I'm not. I'm, I'm a dirtbag in all of this. I'd be a test subject. I'd be somebody that the NSA would experiment on. I'd be like some test guinea pig that they could just kind of like, you know, use and fool around with and fuck around with. Um, so it's not that I'm that important, but, um, you know, I can definitely see where, um, you know, there, there may be a day when, when, uh, when uh, you know, those, those things will be more, more relevant and important. You mentioned the idea of a very skinny puppy concept, and um, I think that makes sense to anybody that's watched the video. Warden had a question. How do you approach lyrics differently between Skinny Puppy and Ogre? Because to me, this video, this song, is a very purely Skinny Puppy song. Yeah, it is. It is. I, I think that, you know, sometimes I wonder if, if the lines blur a bit myself, and, and, and I'm not sure. I mean, I try my best to, um, uh, you know, draw a clear line be between Skinny Puppy as a, as a far more conceptual idea in the sense of, you know, this album for me has been kind of, um, roaming around in my gut for about three years conceptually and I'm very proud with kind of how the concept came into fruition and, and uh, um, you know uh, came to life and the differences between Ogre and Skinny Puppy is uh, on this album probably a little less because Kevin went back to a, a less um, densely kind of constructed um, Song uh, structure and 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 uh, you know uh, kind of a simpler, more melodic thing. So it was easier to uh, latch onto with the melodic vocal. And in the past, you know, Handover was a far more experimental sort of machine and beast. But the basic difference is um, to cut this this long story short, <laughs> is that uh, Ogre is something far more personalized, and uh, Skinny Puppy has become something that um, after. 30 years of wandering in the dust and mist and uh, making a lot of mistakes and learning um, can now be, you know, a more realized, hopefully, a, a more realized outward view um, of things and not necessarily a correct one or, or a righteous one or the best one, but, it, but it's definitely a different view on things um, during this paradigm shift. And we've always tried to do that conceptually within Skinny Puppy. So, you know, and I guess, you know, things blur sometimes when you have album titles like Sunny PsyOps and, and then we're talking about the NSA here. I mean, there's there's all sorts of uh, uh, places where the two collide. But um, 
in a nutshell, I guess, it, for the most part, Skinny Puppy's music is written before vocals go down. And in Ogre's case, uh, we may start with um, a song structure that, uh, once a vocal is put down, could be erased completely and evolve and go somewhere else completely. And those are the two differences, I think. Um, besides all the, uh, you know, all the rest of the poppycock I just talked about. <laughs> so we have actually a lot of questions about the thematic ideas behind the tour that's coming up, um, a couple of months away already. Um, Deep Down Dead Doll asks, "Will there be blood?" Uh, well, um, just just note to everybody, I, I have an allergy now to red food dye, but it doesn't stop me. I, I, I had an allergy to cats and to dogs, and, and that didn't stop me. So, um, uh, But I, I just want people to be aware that what happens to me now uh, with red food dye, it's, it's, a, it's the most fucked up thing, uh, is that if I get it down my throat, uh, it, it causes me to, to, to go hoarse really quickly. It's, it's really weird. I um, can't figure it out. I got, it's an allergy thing, so there's obviously some inflammation involved. Um, but it won't stop me from using blood <laughs> for this tour. So yes, there will be blood. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what was that from? Eh? Yes, there will be blood. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any hints about a set list or um, a song concept for the tour? Well, no. That would be no fun, wouldn't it? Would it? I mean, <laughs> No, we're doing we're doing a lot more new material. Um, that's one thing for sure. Uh, and uh, again, uh, a, 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 you know, a theater concept of sorts, and uh, um, a lot more new material actually on this tour for sure. Very cool. Um, Two Door Pork wanted to ask if you were going to think of doing any more reimaginings of existing songs like you did with Solvent on this album. Well, the idea at one point was to, um, you know, maybe the fans could help us with this too in a lot of ways. <laughs> the one thing we wanted to do was try and um, actually uh, buy back our back catalog from Network. Uh, it didn't go down very well, I have to say. My my initial letter was was uh, was you know um, had a uh, negative response, um, and so the idea has been to, to like look at some past stuff based on <laughs> audience response. Um, and re-record it, and, th and that's it's a slippery road to go down because obviously people have attachments to the old songs. We were the ones who made the terrible deal back in the day and signed a, a pact with the devil that that continues on to this day with Network and a third-party licensing thing that I could go into great detail about, but um, it's a kind of a disgusting act of of, uh, of betrayal for a company that basically built their. Um, their entire catalog upon the backs of our merchandising. It was all done out of a house with us not seeing a penny. And, you know, we were stupid. We didn't realize how much money was being generated and all these things. So so we're in a bad position for that stuff. So we have entertained that thought, but, um, you know, it's, it's a slippery slope because you don't want to, uh, you know, I certainly want to don't want to do what I, uh, an unnamed band did at one time, which was, uh, go out and completely redo their material in a way that wasn't appealing to their current audience and kind of uh, more redid their material uh, according to a current genre of music as opposed to just trying to, um, which I think is what we accomplished in Solvent. I think Kevin did an amazing job with Solvent as far as um, recreating it with a feel that goes back to that, harkens back to that time, but uh, just this buoyant kind of, Amazing arrangement, and uh, uh, it was just a, a pleasure to sing. So, if things can go down like that, and if the fans are into it, you know, we'd certainly be interested in doing it. But it would have to be, um, it would really have to be uh, as a result of fans requesting us to do that, I think, at this point. Because, again, it's a slippery slope to kind of redo yourself and throw it out there. I think. Okay, so fans, you have the mission now. Uh, yes. Black Ocina asked about overdose the other song on the album that is sort of a recreation, but that's one that never saw the light of day in the first place. And he wanted to know a little bit about the backstory about what made you pick that up off the shelf. Uh, well, Kevin grabbed it off the shelf and, and, and presented it, and uh, it was basically, it's basically um, unchanged. I actually wanted to do um, more work on it just to kind of um, add a few more layers to it um, to modernize it, and then I, I ac acquiesced to what Kevin preferred, which was it to stay as the uh, the original master was from 
from Mushroom Studios. So, um, you know, I, I agreed with that. And uh, so that, that uh, version of, of Overdose is uh, basically, uh, you know, st the straight master from uh, the, that time period with a new vocal over top of it. Um, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Speaking also of the old days, we've got a question from X28. He wants to know if you could finally explain what the spooky horn is that you're credited with on remission. Great choices, Corey. Great choices. <laughs> awesome. Oh, thank you. I don't sense any sarcasm in your voice whatsoever. <laughs> no, no, no. I'll, I'll, I'll be totally self-deprecating here because, you know, it's, a lot of time has gone by now. But, uh, you know, when I first started Skinny Puppy, I was a uh, feckless 22-year-old or 23-year-old um, my father had passed away three years before, um, or two years before, and I had moved to Vancouver um, as a record racker. I was selling off-catalog product like Joy Division's um, uh, Unknown Pleasures was one of the, my my uh, my big sellers, and Mango and uh, labels uh, Blue Note reissues, a bunch of off-catalog stuff to stores. So uh, I found myself. Um, uh, a year after my father died or something, my grandfather died, and I was left with a small st stipend of money, and uh, I didn't really know what to do. I'd, I'd left uh, high school with, uh, again, an, a very feckless stance of, of uh, having no direction. So uh, I started writing music, and po I always wrote poetry, and, and uh, I loved to write poetry, and uh, uh, stream of consciousness poetry when I was quite young. So I uh, got together with some people in Vancouver and uh, started working on music uh, as someone who with absolutely no musical background and um, I think I picked up guitar when I was 14 and learned the first you know um, first um, four or five bars of yes um, uh, well, roundabout <laughs> with the harmonics and everything and then gave it up but you know I've, I've since come back around and, and uh, you know a lot of things have coalesced and uh, so spooky horn was basically, I think, in a way, uh, and I'm not sure if I, I certainly didn't put it in there, but I think it was a way of Kevin and, and at that time uh, giving me some semblance of the feeling of being a musician <laughs> at a time when I was uh, more of a grunting vocalist and a very insecure grunting vocalist at that. I had no uh, training with the voice at all. It was all very, uh, you know, jump into it head first. And I was an extremely insecure person, too. Um, so... Uh, it was a trial by fire and one of the best things I ever did. So uh, the the spooky horn, for however self-deprecating it is now, was the the kind of uh, paper wall that I jumped through in order to kind of find um, strength uh, through a fear that was, was uh, you know, I guess not misguided, but was definitely an ir irrational fear. So it's truly a metaphor? I, I could be, yeah, you know, spooky horn. It's like that bad fart. That just kind of <laughs> <lingers>. <clears throat> so to take you back to that time a bit, we have a great question from uh, Binary. If you were 17 again and you had the chance to ask Ian Curtis anything, what would you ask him? Oh, my God. This is like the, this is the, the, the total Harry Potter thing, isn't it? It's like, well, I think that if I was to go back uh, and ask... Um, Ian Curtis, anything, uh, it would be, uh, you know, what what was it at that point in his life that made him uh, take his life? Um, um, especially knowing now that it was basically uh, more of a female is issue than a lot of the other stuff that was going on in his head. And um, I guess that would be the question I'd ask him. I'd also uh, be very interested in, you know, what motivated a lot of his lyrical imagery, which was, uh, I think, you know, in a lot of ways religious-based um, to a certain degree. And uh, perhaps, um, you know, obviously I'd be a total fan. It would be like the first time I met Dario Argento, and so I don't know what I'd say. <laughs> well, also taking you back to then and now, um, yes, it's me again as a question for you. Can you describe a song that's really changed its meaning over time that you play now that you wrote when you were 20-something? Uh, well, that's obvious. I mean, Smothered Hope to me is is the um, 
is the apex of that. When I wrote that song, with a rope you hang what's empty can't remain, to put it simply, in time, cry the hollow words to sing with false disguise. And, uh, and since then, um, I know I've grown quite a bit to where I've become that um, older person singing this song uh, with you know, somewhat of a false disguise, even now. Um, you know, getting back to Ian Curtis to a certain degree, I mean, um, I think now if I was to ask Ian Curtis a question, I, I would kind of empathize more with his, um, his ability to let go of life to a certain degree. I mean, I'm 50 now, and, uh, you know, I certainly um, see a lot of the things and uh, the... Uh, the sorrows and the, uh, the the weight that comes with age to a certain degree, and uh, and with being an artist, uh, if if that's what I can call myself, uh, it, 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 the the amount of kind of uh, uh, weight that's carried with the day to day of going, how do I make this work? Um, when I was in my twenties, I was questioning myself on how will I do this when I'm forty? You know, uh, being paid twice a year. Um, at best, or unless you go on tour, and now even more so uh, with royalties and your intellectual property gone, it's it's even uh, more of a daunting question. So, in a lot of ways, I summon a certain amount of, and this is going to sound a bit odd uh, because I would never do it, and I would never advise anybody to do it. But I understand um, that tenuous grip on this mortal coil, and I have a deeper understanding for. Um, for the uh, you know the chaos that that that, that was in his life you know um, at that time. Is it difficult to put on those clothes with any old songs? Um, uh, yeah, you can't sing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, certain songs are are difficult. I mean, Hearthstone White is certainly you know you know difficult to sing sometimes. Uh, Love in Vain is is uh, is is you know a memory. Um, of being in my apartment in uh, Vancouver uh, when I was about 35, maybe 33, uh, with needles all over the place, and, uh, and knowing in my in my in the little bit of me that was left right here that was still functioning, that was very cognizant and very present, and in all drug addicts, I believe that that exists. Um, thinking to myself, one day I'm going to have to deal with all of this, and uh, and, uh, you know, I was lucky enough to, in a way, do that and come out of what I went through more or less intact. Uh, but still, I mean, I carry a, a great deal of weight. Um, some would call it depression, I guess, but it's something that I've never really uh, had any other outlook on. So it's, it's a unique stance for me. And, and, and I've been through a lot of, uh, well, I mean, I went through a, a large stint of psychotherapy where... Uh, I learned a lot. Uh, I had uh, basically a therapist who, um, at the same age that my father uh, came down with prostate cancer, he was a Vietnam vet, my therapist was. Uh, same age my dad came down and died of prostate cancer, he came down with prostate cancer and survived. So I had an, an incredible gestalt with this person um, during therapy. Uh, but, um, but one thing I learned was that I was born with this weight whatever it is, you know, it's, it's, so I don't know anything different, which is both a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, I can leave it at that, I can go on and on about it, but, uh, but uh, so certainly, uh, you know, songs um, that dealt with personal matters that were very close to me and, and are still very close to me and are things that I haven't resolved, obviously, are still uh, difficult and unique and, and hard to sing sometimes. Well, obviously, there's a lot of stories behind all of the music, uh, James wanted to know if you would ever think of putting it down and write a book. Um, yeah, um, I, I used to kind of always dread that for, for some reason, and and then I um, approached it more like an approach avoidance thing, like so many things in my life, because I have a, uh, you know, I've suffered with attention deficit disorder. Uh, I haven't improved things with uh, the amount of drugs that I did back in the day. My attention deficit, bad, bad self, uh, self, uh, self, self medicating. And uh, um, one thing I said to myself was that uh, I read once, anyway, that you shouldn't, you don't really have a right or you don't have the experience to write anything until you turn 50. So 
I've passed that, and and uh, and now I've got to either put it down or, or play. And I've been doing some some writing uh, just for for magazines. You know, I did a little piece in the upcoming um, Fang, Fangoria on Jim Van Beber. So I'm flexing that muscle of memory, and the way that I want to approach it is to, um, you know, be a total open book. I think I've always tried to be an open book musically and, and with my art, and so the, the same thing would be with a book. If I was ever to write something, I'd probably go more with the recollections of the people that were close to me at the time than with a lot of my own recollections um, because I was lucky enough to be um, in, you know, in both, you know, very clear and, you know, present states, but also, um, you know, I've been to the abyss and back. So um, I, I'd be interested in, in, in uh, you know, not non-censored, a no holds barred kind of reflection on myself through the eyes of other people in a lot of ways. I think that'd be interesting. So, so yeah, I, I have some ideas on something that I'm, you know, you know, writing little bits and bits and bits into. But again, like Arto, which again I don't want to put myself up in the levels of Arto. I'm nowhere near what Arto could ever be or ever was. But with that same fragmentation, you know, that's the way my life works, unfortunately, and that's based on uh, my past and on the way I was raised and the. Um, conditions I was I was raised in. You know. Well, in that vein, uh, the Sugar Plum wanted to ask about your literary influences on performance and and the lyrics. Um, literary influences. Well, um, right now, um, a heavy diet of Philip K. Dick because of uh, the um, the satellite that spoke to him. And um, uh, prior to that, I mean, uh, I think two of my favorite novels, which again I think everybody knows, uh, one of my most one of the most inspirational things for Skinny Puppy that I've ever read was uh, a book by Isidore Ducasse, whose pen name was Lotremont, um, called Maldor. And uh, two other, uh, another author I, I uh, really uh, enjoy a lot was was Hussmans, who did um, La Bas or down there. And Au Revoir, which was kind of a interesting look of a person who went into the French countryside and tried to create his perfect uh, world. I believe in like the 16th century, uh, his perfect existence in a in a environment. So he had a tortoise that was encrusted with diamonds and jewels that would walk across the floor, and at certain times of the day it would hit the light in a certain way. He was just this completely created this complete utopian universe around himself that was this in tightly enclosed. Um, um, sanctuary that became a prison, and uh, it breaks breaks loose when he has to go out and get a tooth removed in the 16th century. It's just appalling, <laughs> terrifying. So uh, there's that, and there's also a book. Uh, obviously, um, one of my favorite trilogies was 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 uh, was the Titus Grown trilogy, and uh, uh, um, and and uh, another great Gothic novel is is one called Melmoth the Wanderer, which is by Charles Maturin. Um, which I've always kind of I've reread a couple of times now, and I, I just absolutely love. So, well, you just mentioned Titus Grown and the Gorman Gas trilogy. We had a great question from Fuchsia: If you got to perform um, acting in a theater production of Gorman Gas, which character would you want to play? Um, that's easy. That'd be Mr. Play, of course. Mr. Play is uh, the. Uh, the uh, man about the castle that knows everything and says nothing, and his knees click every time he walks. His joints are all clicky, which I uh, I personally can empathize with. So it would definitely be Mr. Fly. Um, let's see. Let's try and get through a bunch of them because we're already 40 minutes in. Um, you want to do the lightning round? <laughs> All right, let's see here. You just popped out, Corey. I'm not here anymore. <clears throat> no, you're there now. Okay. Ice Scott, if Skinny Puppy were ever to do late night television, what song would you play? Um, if we were to do late night television, what song would I play? Um, well, I mean, if we were to do late night to television, it would probably be um, in association with a new album. So I, I assume it would be something off of a new album <laughs> if we ever got on late night TV. Um, I guess as a secondary song, we'd probably do maybe Warlock. I, I don't know. Uh, it, you know, if, if we ever got on late night TV, <laughs> it would be because of some sort of novelty song that we created that um, 
got us that gig, so I'm sure we'd have to use that song. <laughs> um, here's a great question from a user named me. What did you guys for Halloween? Uh, what did I go out at? I'd never yeah. go out in Halloween. I never go out. Like, that's, that's that 364 days a year thing that I try and avoid. I, I, I sit at home and uh, I, I listen to old radio programs, old ghost stories. Um, I live up in a mountain, so there's no kids. Uh, and for a number of years, I don't really pay attention to holidays. I'm, I, I hate to say it. Uh, I did when I was young. I loved the smell of uh, the, the leaves in autumn in Calgary. Uh, the rotting leaves and uh, um, just that that fall smell was was something I always remember with Halloween. The swirling leaves it reminded me a lot of the Halloween trailer for the um, initial Halloween film. I have fond memories of that. Uh, now not so much because I guess you know uh, you know I, I I I play a Halloween character on TV <laughs> or I I you know that's kind of what I do as as a as a day job, so so I guess you know the makeup when you do that 60 shows in a row, it's not as exciting. But I should get out there and do it again. I was at a convention um, in Florida over the last couple of weeks, uh, Spooky Empire, and met Jordy from Merrill Manson, who's a really nice guy. Um, really enjoyed spending the time we, we spent together, and he was he's kind of open and self-deprecating like me. And uh, his girlfriend is a makeup artist who was uh, on that uh, that television show for makeup. I can't remember what it's called, uh, but she I, he sent me a, a just a little a little picture of, of how he got dressed up, and it was just incredible. So I should probably get my game up for Halloween, but I'm you know I, I, I stay at home and nestle with uh, with my dogs. Question from stubborn puppet. Uh, how do you pick the letters that you capitalize in the song titles and uh, and your internet posts? Uh, just it's just random. I mean, it's obviously there's times you 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 like split things up with syllables, or you find words within words, and I'll accent those. Or I'll it, it's a visual thing too. I'm I'm really visually I, I'm a visual learner, so so I think I, I look at things very visually. And I think that's it's just an, an aesthetic thing. There's there's no real rhyme or reason to it. Uh, so if I found any secret codes in those letters, I've made them up myself. No, there are some secret codes. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, if you guys been some stick to the lie, Hunger. Uh, no, it's true. I mean, there, there, there has been some codes, but generally speaking, it's not it's not done that way um, on purpose. When there's happy accidents, sure, I'll I'll embrace them, but you know, I'm not planning ciphers here or anything you know, necessarily. <laughs> Um, a couple of people, uh, including Carrie and Faze, wanted to know if there's a pro shot video of the Two Dark Park tour, and if so, if there's any way that anything could happen with that. Not, not in our, in our, um, in our grasp. And I, I, I've never heard of that before. But I think um, someone did mention something about uh, some of the people that shot uh, the ministry videos. Had shot Two Dark Park, and honestly, uh, until just recently, I wasn't aware of that. So I'm, I'm totally. Uh, the only footage I thought we had of Two Dark Park was the stuff that um, uh, was in the can from Jin Van Beber. I thought up until now. So uh, that's something that if if someone can give me contact information for some of these people, I'd like to go and track down because we really have no um, documentation of that tour because. I think I've said this somewhere. Uh, at that time, you could actually um, ask for no camera policies, and they'd be followed and, and strictly adhered to. And our uh, crew, uh, composed of Scully and, and uh, whoever was around that time, did a very good job of making sure there's no uh, cameras taking any any video of that. For as, as far as I know, and uh, uh, there's 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 so little of it that um, yeah, I'd be happy to to see some of it surface, and especially a pro shot. Um, if there's some way we could get our hands on that, we definitely look at a way of putting that out for sure. I mean, I'd love to see that see the light of day. That was kind of one of my favorite tours of all time. So yeah, if you can help me, anybody out there knows where to get in touch. Oh. <coughs> too, because I would love to uh, I would love to see that footage. Okay, great. So the fans have another mission. Um, a lot of these people are probably not listening right now because they're probably all in bed, but we had a lot of people asking if there's any European tour plans. 
Um, yeah, well, I, there, there is. We're, we're like looking into it right now. We just hired. Uh, we 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 basically re um, um, are reestablishing our entire business uh, base, and that includes uh, management. And uh, um, the only thing that stayed behind with us is our accountants because they're wonderful and you know have been very helpful in bad times. We had a, a horrible tour in Europe last time. Uh, where either our tour manager or somebody went off with eighty thousand dollars plus, uh, we basically came back on the bus. Uh, you were there, Corey, you know, and uh, and I I, I I think I remember waving goodbye to you actually, Corey, <laughs> in Lil. And, and at that point, I realized I was like, bye, bye, nice English guys, bye, nice Manchester tour manager. Of course, bye, Corey, love you. And then waving goodbye to all of our money and everything. It's just like bye. <laughs> In little friends. So um, a bit, you know, we're both a bit nervous about touring in Europe for these reasons. But we have a new person kind of looking. Um, it's it's a person who books uh, ba, um, Peter Murphy and Killing Joke uh, uh, in in certain territories, and she's from the UK and she's worked the UK um, festival circuit. So um, we're looking at the possibility of, of, of her, and so we're we're just we're just looking into that right now. Um, and yeah, we want to do dates if, if things can be done. In a pragmatic and, and proper fashion, you know right. what that tour was like, Corey. You know. Oh, yeah, that was a fun time in my life. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it a ball buster. The what? For all of us, it was a ball buster for all of us. Yes, I'm still limping. <laughs> uh, Andrew I'm still Gowans. icing one of my balls. <laughs> Andrew Goins has a question. He wanted to know if you'd consider doing any special merch for the tour. And he had the idea of uh, overdose on seven inch, since that's the one thing on the album that's not on vinyl. Um, yeah, that was an idea. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'll, I, I can put that out to Kevin. We had talked about doing a seven inch with Metropolis, and they didn't seem to be too interested in the idea uh, initially. But yeah, I could, we could talk about something like that. Uh, you know, it'd be great to have something else if we could find something else from that period. Um, you know, right now we're both pretty busy and just kind of uh, ramping up for this tour so you know stuff like that we've, we've been through we have a new merchandiser uh, that we're using and uh, they wouldn't be dealing with that but that's something we're looking at posters right now some really nice high quality posters that Alan Yeager did um, a long time ago uh, that we're kind of looking at incorporating um, especially after going to see Goblin and seeing some of the posters that were at the Goblin show they're just really nice so we're looking at some Sorry. offset printing of those posters and then um, and then whatever else, yeah. So you know, Andrew, we we, we like might look into the the seven inch thing. Thank you for reminding me. I I I'd forgotten about that, and uh, I know Kevin had, had mentioned that to Metropolis. So we'll look into it and see. Okay, um, I'm going to continue with the rapid fire here to get through as many as possible. Um, Mind Ripper, favorite SP song before and after your Reformation. Oh my God. Um, jeez. That's hard. Uh, um, that's a really hard question. There's a lot of songs. I mean, I mean, for me now, honestly, uh, you know, favorite songs are kind of. Um, I mean, you know, I still get goosebumps singing Warlock to a certain degree. Um, uh, t to me, I think uh, trying to approach challenging new material is what kind of gives me, or material that in the past we approached and and it didn't really go off as well. Um, is something that I enjoy doing and, and, I, and I get kind of a kick out of. As far as favorite songs go, it changes from tour to tour and, and honestly from year to year. So I, I don't really, you know, I honestly can't think of, of uh, you know, the last set that we did, I enjoyed kind of singing all the songs because I actually had a handle on most of them <laughs> where it wasn't, uh, you know, there wasn't moments where, where I was struggling as, as much. So I think, I think that's kind of... Um, I want to leave that. There's no real favorite songs per se um, anymore. I mean, they're all kind of. If, if we choose a set, I'm kind of approaching each one of those songs as a favorite song in a way, unless it really bites me in the ass, then I hate it. Um, a bunch of people also wanted to know about the taping policy for this tour. Whether you'd be supporting people recording it. Um, yeah, I have no problem. The, the only problem with with um, you know, taping to, to me is just that 
I mean, I honestly, I mean, you can't stop it. A, and I wouldn't want to stop anybody from doing what they really want to do in, in life. But I, I would say that uh, one of the oddest things to me is, as as an old fart in this business, <laughs> is seeing uh, a sea of people uh, watching a live show through their iPhones. And uh, it, it's 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 always it's 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 both a, a uniquely kind of interesting social construct and and also one that's just odd to me because I mean and then maybe a lot of these people are looking past their iPhones but I mean I've, I have done the test where I've looked and people are really looking through their iPhones to see the show <laughs> so there's that aspect to it the other aspect of, of a skinny puppy show because they're kind of dark shows in a way uh, and especially when we're using a lot of film uh, as lighting sometimes the effect is is uh, greatly diminished by flash photography and all of those things that you're not supposed to use on the haunted mansion and things like that. So, from that perspective, I I, I would uh, you know I, I I would say it's not as great of an experience. But uh, no, we've never had any any qualms about. I don't have any qualms about uh, taping the shows um, really at all. I mean, I, I think it's it's part of the you know it's part of the process. No pun intended. Uh, number two pencil has a question actually in that vein. How has marketing for a digital audience changed? over the years since you guys first started with an FTP site ages ago? Um, well, I mean, for me, not much at all because I'm not really that involved <laughs> in social in social media except that I, I maintain a Facebook page because somebody assumed my identity when I, I didn't have a Facebook page. So, um, and, and I do, you know, I do converse a bit more now than I probably did uh, back then, but, um, you know, obviously, you know, social media is uh, you know part of our lives right now, uh, whether we like it or not. I I choose to see it as kind of um, not necessarily having the best effect on 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 my life. You know, it doesn't really um, it doesn't really affect me both positively or negatively. I guess I can get a message out to people that I'll be somewhere um, at some time, but uh, the constant um, talking about myself and and um, you know, Facebook has been quoted to me as being the world's biggest vanity mirror to a certain degree, and uh, just the change to, to me too. And um, I was having a talk with Ashley on the way home tonight about how, um, you know, she's a 20 years younger than me, and and uh, when I met uh, possible girlfriends in the past, you definitely meet the person before you 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 see them physically. And talk to them before anything happened, and uh, uh, that's turned to 180 now uh, in a lot of relationships that are, you know, uh, they're the foundation of a lot of relationships for a lot of people. Young people is um, uh, created in an online virtual environment where you've never, you know, you actually meet the person weeks later sometimes or months later even, uh, which I find kind of a unique social paradigm shift. Um, so there's there's all of that stuff, and and uh, for for me, I'm um, a bit of an introvert still, although I've you know I'm obviously not. I've pulled my pants around my ankles more than once, <laughs> and uh, and I've uh, allowed myself in a number of situations to have my ankles or my pants pulled down around my ankles. So um, my my life is kind of out there, dirty, clean, uh, proud, and broken. Uh, and so I, I kind of still value the fact that I don't have to um, feel bad if someone has seen that I've um, viewed their message on Facebook, but I haven't responded right away. There's that part of it that just really irks me to death. You know? It's it's an invasion of your privacy, and uh, and 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 with some people, it it, it makes them angry and creates uh, you know. Unnecessary strife in both people's life. I think you know. So there's all those things that I'm I'm just not tapped into, and I guess maybe that's because it's it's a different generation um, for me, and I have to kind of step back and and I'll allow the new people to come in, and and I'll fold and fade into the background. You know, with regards to well, I wanted to ask Jason about that with the ending of the video. How much of that is um, is about surveillance? How much of that is about um, our own vanity mirror, as Ogre put it. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. 
uh, that's actually more ogre as well. That's definitely uh, was his real. The ending was the thing he was most um, most excited about and most wanted to be involved in. So um, that would almost you can you can probably defer that question back to him. <laughs> okay. Well, we're, what was the question again? Sorry. <laughs> uh, the ending of the video where he's smashing the. Right. The Blackberry, how much of that is, is about what you were just talking about and how much of it is about... Yeah, I mean, it is. It is all about that, I guess, in, in a way. It's, it's, it, it, it really goes back to the idea of, um, you know, uh, there's a book, I think it's called Entertaining Ourselves to, or Amusing Ourselves to Death or, um, you know, the Aldous Huxley idea of, of Brave New World where we, 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 we basically have bought into something that's enslaving us, you know. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's all bells and whistles until... Until you 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 have a real disagreement with the power structure, and then um, and things then things can be easily controlled and managed. And and uh, again, if if there is this this meta um, data being collected, and uh, the filters that are being used, basically, you know, any kind of construct can be made. You know, in much in the same way as as Minority Report. You know, uh, you can go back and construct any kind of uh, personality. Um, um, analogy about anybody based on uh, you know and 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 uh, come up with a number of different analogs for that analogy based on past data and so all that stuff that was uh, considered private at one time obviously isn't and uh, and uh, yeah so the idea at the end of the video was to just you know um, you know kill the babysitter in a lot of ways you know kill the connection drop the connection don't be as dependent on the connection because you're the one that's feeding it everything it needs to ultimately control you or or destroy you whatever you know control you destroy you um, you know um, sell to you all the things that in the past we as a society uh, you know held ourselves you know a bit of a hand back from whether it was false advertising for toys or whatever you know we've entered a a time of hyper reality in a lot of ways, you know, where the model precedes the real, and the Baudrillard construct is here now. So, you know, you can basically uh, construct any kind of personality archetype about about anybody and use it um, to to do anything to them. And again, it's 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 the idea of like, well, if I don't do anything wrong, then what do I have to worry about? But it's not so much about you doing something wrong. It's if it's if the power system above you changes at any time. So. I think that's kind of, uh, you know, and again, we're talking openly <laughs> on the very system that, that is is, uh, is enslaving us in a lot of ways. You know, it's the way I see it. I mean, I mean, people see it as freedom. I mean, I don't. I see, I see Facebook as something that's just a, it's a chore. It's something that you need to, you know, if you're addicted to it, great. But if you're not, it's something that you, you, you feel obligated to do and obligated to maintain or obligated to, you know, I'm talking to some bands where it's just like, these are punk bands, where they're like, you know, if we don't have something on Instagram every 20 minutes, we lose 14 people. It's just like it's crazy to me. It's it's like, it's it's it, it's just there's nothing about art anymore. It's it's just about, uh, you know, it's it's about feeding this this content machine and and getting likes. <laughs> well, thank you to YouTube for hosting this chat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fuck you, YouTube. I mean, thank you, YouTube, for hosting this chat. Yes. <laughs> no, the irony is uh, is not lost on. Them on any of us, I think. Um, we've been doing this for about an hour, so uh, we should probably start to wrap it up. So I wanted to ask, um, first, Jason, if there's anything else coming up for you that people who like the video should look out for, and if people are interested in more of your work, what they can look for. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm working on a new album right now, so that's uh, you can find that through the alacrity.net or uh, through the various evil social media, uh, you know, uh, places. Um, and uh, I'm also currently, uh, I wrote a feature version of my short Astrid, and so um, instead of trying to shop the feature around, which is uh, pretty difficult, especially these days, uh, recently, obviously, with the way financially uh, things are going in the business, I'm developing it into a graphic novel, so um, I'm going to start a, a Kickstarter for that here shortly, raise some funds for it, probably get around 10 grand together, and uh, work with some artists, and uh, i got to realize that as a graphic novel, and then shop that around for a feature. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much what's going on with me. Um, and then just one last thing I just want to say uh, to get out of the way. Um, just I want to give a couple 
shout out to uh, some of the people that helped out with the video because everybody's been really cool and really nice to me about uh, you know congratulating me for it and everything and uh, definitely wasn't all me couldn't have done it without uh, my director of photography Ken Dodge who also shot Astrid as well my my short um, which you can find on my Vimeo page um, also uh, Kimber Parrish did the uh, special effects makeup Damon Shelton who did the uh, really cool spiders and all the um, CGI effects and um, I'm probably leaving out. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm leaving out a couple other people as well. Uh, Chelsea Turner, the production design. So a lot of great people donated their time because they wanted to be part of this video because they were fans. And uh, I've never had an easier time getting people to work for free. So that was really good um, because everybody did it as a as a passion project. Um, but still, everybody worked really hard and did a really good job. And uh, it's, that's how I ended up with uh, how we all ended up with uh, the video being as uh, as good as it is. Well, fantastic work to everybody. Ogre, what's next for Skinny Puppy, if there's a tease for about the tour, and uh, also, what's next with Ogre? Uh, well, this tour is all-encompassing right now for me. I'm, I've been, like, uh, basically just uh, getting all the elements together for that. Um, that's it until probably March. Right now, uh, Mark Walk is... Uh, driving around the country with his wife, uh, exploring the southwest and some amazing uh, hikes and nature. So we're going to get back into doing the ogre thing uh, sometime in the new year and uh, finish that. Uh, we had a working title for it, which I'm not going to give you. <laughs> and uh, uh, besides that, I, I just finished a short with Chris Alexander from, um, from Fangoria, the editor from Fangoria called Queen of Blood, which is a sequel to his um, his short Blood for Arena, uh, which I'm, I'm, I had a blast doing, and uh, um, that's about it, just uh, plugging forward, keeping it moving. So, I mean, I've got a lot to do until the tour starts, which, you know, wakes me up at 4.45 a.m. and staring at the ceiling going, holy fuck, here we go. Once more into the breach. <laughs> Well, Ogre, Jason, and Afra hiding there in the corner. Thank you guys so much for making this happen. Um, Thanks for having me. I've had a great thank time you to now. everybody out there who has submitted questions and who shared this on Facebook and Tumblr and everywhere. Um, and hopefully uh, you enjoyed it. And, hey, maybe we'll do it again sometime. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, everybody's awesome. You guys come to our show. You know, it'll be cool. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> and Jason, awesome job in the video. Afra, thank you very much. Corey, as always, you're a mensch. Yeah, thanks, um, Corey, for working this up. And Afra, thanks so much. And thanks, everybody, that's up by to watch. Thanks, Ogre. Uh, you heard it here. Come to the show. It'll be cool. Please. <laughs> All right, we'll see you there. All right. Ciao, everybody. Thanks.